cool. So for those of you who don't know, Citizens Online has been going since the year 2000. We work around the UK helping organisations ensure that the digital age we now live in doesn't exclude people. You can find us on Twitter at Citizens Online One. My name is James Beecher. I'm Research Manager at Citizens Online. I'm James D. Beecher and I'm joined today by my colleague Francis Barton who will be managing the chat and answering some of your questions later on. He's at Ludic Tech. Today I'm going to provide a little bit of introduction and welcome which we've done some of already. The main focus of the chat is going to be me doing a rundown of 15 accessibility tips and then we'll have a Q&A about half the session as I said for lots of sharing of challenges, experiences and tips that you have. Before we do that I'm just going to launch this poll which some of you may have seen me test just now to find out a little bit more about who we have on the call. Um, well, some people have already been voting in that, I see. Um, hopefully you can see the questions and vote in it, those of you who haven't yet voted. So the options on this poll, I'll just read these out because the recording doesn't capture this. Uh, I consider myself disabled. I work on digital accessibility. I work with disabled people. I work in web or app design, or I'm just interested. And we've got about 35 of the 46 of you have voted. A few more people still voting. We'll just leave it a little longer to see if anyone else can vote in that poll. It's great, we've got 80% of you voting now. And we're up to 48 people have joined the call. So I'll just read out the results from this. I'll show them to you. So really exciting that most people that we've got on the call work in web or app design, 43%, 17 participants. So that's great. Hopefully we can give you some tips today. We are kind of doing an introduction today. So some of what we talk about may be familiar to you already, but hopefully there'll be time to discuss things that are less familiar as well. Also interesting that um, another 20% of people say they work on digital accessibility in some capacity and another 20% saying they work with disabled people. We've also got uh, someone on the call who considers themselves disabled and we've got plenty of people who are just interested, 15% as well. So that's interesting, good spread of different people. Hopefully we'll have something for everyone while we talk through these tips. Before we get to the tips, just really briefly, the problem that we're trying to address and that we're focused on today is digital exclusion. We know that 2.8 million disabled people are not online, about one in five disabled people, and that compares to about 5% of people who are not disabled. We also know that it's not just a matter of who is online or not, but people's digital capabilities, their digital skills, and again, those tend to be lower among disabled people. Crucially, around 3.4% of disabled people or over 400,000 people have used the internet but are not current internet users. And one of the reasons for that is that they often encounter digital services which are inaccessible to them or difficult to use at least. At the moment, we know that this sort of thing is particularly important because those who are most at risk of the virus, those who are older, many of whom also have disabilities or those who have long-term health conditions, which may be um, so significant as to cause disabilities, those people are also the most likely to be digitally excluded. And those people are also being asked to do more and more things online, like registering as high risk for priority supermarket slots, or indeed just doing online shopping and applying for loss of income benefits like universal credit. So today we're gonna to provide a little introduction to digital accessibility. Um, just to explain that term first off, um, people are probably familiar with the idea of accessibility, the ability to access a physical space. Digital accessibility is really just an extension of that for the digital world. And when we talk about this, we like to emphasize that all of the users of your digital services have different needs. Everyone likes to interact with digital services in a different way, and we can all at certain points be temporarily impaired in our use of a device. So when we're cooking, and we have messy hands or when we're in the bath but we want to change the 
podcast we're listening to or something like that. We all have situations where we can't necessarily use devices in the way that we usually do. However, that said, it's really important to emphasize that disabled people face particular challenges and don't just face them temporarily, but face them on a day-to-day -day basis. And so from both a civil rights and a business perspective, it's worth really thinking about how well served people who are disabled are by digital products. Um, Global Accessibility Awareness Day is today, which is why we're, we're hosting this particular workshop. They have a really good website, globalaccessibilityawarenessday.org, with lots of good information on there. They highlight that around the world, a billion people have disabilities. And they use a commonly used um, taxonomy or way of dividing up those disabilities to help us understand them. So people might have visual disabilities or impairments. They may be blind or partially sighted, and in which case they'll need things that help them to interpret images. People might have, people might be deaf or hard of hearing and they'll therefore need captioning for videos. People with motor impairments may need different devices to navigate web services. And people with cognitive impairments will have preferences for uncluttered screens, consistent navigation, use of plain language and so on. So on to our tips. A lot of the time, the people that we work with are not designing websites themselves. They outsource this, they contract with another organization to build a website for them. So our first tip is that you should make accessibility part of the contract. It's worth saying that there is legislation around this. The EU has Directive 2102, which was first passed in 2016 on the accessibility of websites and mobile applications of public sector bodies. It's already in effect. And in the UK, there's a really helpful overview on the website accessibility.campaign.gov.uk. This highlights the fact that there are already in place regulations for public sector organizations regarding new websites and apps and have been since last year. But from September this year, all public sector websites will need to be will need to be compliant with accessibility legislation in the UK. Now, obviously, many of you may not be working or designing public sector websites, but we really think that this sort of legislation could be extended, or at least the principles behind it should be adhered to by as many people as possible. The legislation is itself based on something called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which are produced by the Web Accessibility Initiative of the um, W3C organization. I'm afraid I've temporarily lost what that acronym refers to, but essentially a global um, organization looking after the web. These Web Content Accessibility Guidelines are very detailed and complex. So at the end of the session, I'll talk about some resources that make it easier for you to access and understand these. I'm just going to skip through these slides, which are, which are in the wrong place at the moment. The second thing that we can talk about, though, is content management systems. Many people who are using websites don't export their web design, or at least not fully. Instead, they use a system such as WordPress or Squarespace, Wix, or many of the off-the-shelf systems where you effectively access a web design that has been constructed for you but you edit the content and some aspects of the layout. When you do this, at least for some of the services, you can select accessible themes or effectively designs for your website. So to show you an example here, this is what it looks like when you do this in WordPress. If you're logged into the site, at least how I log into it, you would see this themes option on the left. And one of the options for how to filter the themes available to you as designs for your website lists whether they're accessibility ready. It's important to say that this doesn't mean that everything that goes on your website will then be accessible. It means that aspects of the structure and design of the website enable best practices. So I'll now move on to talking about what some of those best practices are. And some of these things will be different depending on how you're um, designing your website. So our third tip is that you should allow users to customize their experience of a website. 
that might be as simple as meaning that their device can customize the website for them. So designing your website to be what's called responsible, responsive, as in it will adjust the size of the screens to a large screen device, a tablet, or to a mobile phone. But you can go beyond this and enable people to change colors on the website, the size of fonts, or the contrast through click buttons rather than through using um, the tools that are available through their operating system software. The next tip is that you should always let users know where they are. Um, one little fun game that we can maybe play in the chat is if people who have some knowledge of this would like to give us the words that they refer to to the system for letting a user know where they are. Um, I'll come back to that and mention the word that we refer to the system that we use. Um, but it'd be nice to hear from some of the web designers to describe how they show where someone is on a website. You can also make navigation easier through things like a skip to main content link, which will allow people to jump past contents or other content that's um, at the early part of a web page. It's important in terms of navigation to remember that some people will be using a keyboard only or a device similar to, more similar to a keyboard than to a mouse when navigating your site or service. So it's quite easy to test this yourself by using just the tab, space, enter and arrow keys and see how you can navigate around a website or around your website. Though as usual, we'd emphasize that it's best to get disabled people themselves involved in testing. Tip number six is to give the user control. Um, I'm sure many of you will have experienced annoying pop-ups and background noise on websites. This is not just annoying for everyone, but it's particularly difficult for people with cognitive impairments or other disabilities. Auto playing videos is a real major example of this. We'd really suggest avoiding that. Um, in all cases, if you can, if there's a video that you really want to promote, you can embed it without it auto playing, give the user the option to play that video when they want to. Following on from that point about video, captions and text transcripts are really useful to allow users to read what is happening if they cannot hear or understand the video. One thing that's particularly important about text transcripts is that they allow people to revisit content and explore it at their own pace at another time. That's something that can help people with cognitive impairments to access content that they may struggle to follow at the pace at which it's delivered originally. Just to give a little example of this, you will hopefully have noticed that there are live captions for this session appearing above the slides today. I'm doing this not through Zoom itself, which doesn't provide any captioning service, but by sharing my Microsoft PowerPoint slides. And PowerPoint, if you're using 365, allows you to present a slideshow by always using subtitles. And you can place them in different parts of the screen. And you can also have subtitle languages that are different from the spoken language. That's really an interesting tool to explore if you haven't used something like that already. It's worth saying, of course, that as automatic captions that are done live, they aren't always perfect. So when we release recordings of our sessions, we upload them to YouTube, which also creates automatic captions. It's helpful to develop your own captions on the basis of these automatic captions, because it saves you time. Although the automatic captions aren't perfect, you can edit them and you've already got at least some of the text there. So this is a screenshot from YouTube when we're editing one of our videos. You'll see there's a subtitles option on the left. This then brings up any subtitles for your video. It can take a couple of hours for automatic captions to appear. That depends on the length of the video and the audio quality. Then you've got a button called edit on classic studio, which takes you through to a screen that will look something like this. You can live edit the captions as you watch the video, which you may need to do to remind yourself of the content. But what I like to do is use this actions tab on the top left, and download the file as a .srt file, 
and edit it just as a text file. The main thing that you find you need to do is correct proper names and to add in punctuation, which is really important for people who are reliant on captions so that they can know where sentences end, take a breather and interpret what's being said. The benefit of using a .srt file is that that's the system that Facebook uses for its captions. So once you've edited the SRT file, as well as re-uploading it to YouTube, you can then upload it to Facebook if you want to put your video there. While we're on the subject of captioning, it's worth explaining this is also worth doing for static images or pictures. This is particularly the case when those pictures contain text, especially if that text is important to what the page is about. Instead of captions, this is usually referred to as alternative or probably more often alt text. And it's very common now in systems like WordPress, but also in social media. So I'm going to show you how you would do this in Twitter. In Facebook, this is automatically enabled. So if you edit a picture on Facebook, you should be able to find a little alternative text option. In Twitter, you need to turn the functionality on. So you need to go into your settings, find accessibility under general, and then there's an option to tick to compose image, in, uh, image descriptions. Once you've enabled that option, when you add an image into a tweet, you can then add a description as in this uh, circled area in the bottom. Here's an example where I've added an image about our next call next week. Now, there's two ways that I could do this. I could actually put the text from the image into the tweet, and then I wouldn't necessarily need to add a description, or I could add a simple description that just explains that the image merely shows our logo. But if I wanted to include some different text in the tweet, simply that said, join us next week, for instance, then I would add a proper transcription of the text that's in the image. And you can see you have a, a, a character limit on that of 420 characters. But this does mean that even if you take a photo of a, of a book text or similar, you can add quite a lot of words into that description. While we're talking about text, it's worth considering how easy to understand that text is. One way that we, uh, one tool that we use to help us with this is the Hemingway app, hemingwayapp.com. This is the default text that you'll see if you go to that website, but you can just paste in your own text over this and similar shading will appear. This tells you things like whether your sentence is too long or complex whether there are individual words that you could use in place of others like utilize that are perhaps more complex than necessary. And it tries to help you improve the writing style as well. It's worth bearing in mind this is an automated process. So you can apply some human judgment about some of these things. But ultimately, the editor will give you a readability grade. The lower the number, the better. And it's also quite helpful. It will show you the number of words. So you can try and reduce that number of words. You could even use this to help you um, draft tweets or things like that. Another aspect that we want to consider when um, adding text to websites is how we organize that text, how we structure it. What's called markup can be really helpful here. The first aspect is headings. Lots of people, when they draft text in documents or online, use bold, but this doesn't actually enable someone using a screen reader or other device to see the structure of a document. So it's really important to use headings. These are hierarchical. So something at heading level three will be nested within everything in heading level two. So in this way, you can jump between different subjects that are at heading level two or different sections that are at heading level three. It's really useful for navigation in that way. Something else you can do with markup is to identify numbered lists, as here for one and two, prepare ingredients and fry onions, and also for unnumbered lists. Both of these things, again, are helpful to indicate to people. And if you do it in markup, it will, it will work better than if you simply write out a number one and a two and so on. Some, some web content management systems will pick up what you're doing automatically and ensure it's described in markup, but that's not always the case. Um, I've probably worth just briefly saying that that markup appears in the HTML language. 
So there'll be little bits of code effectively that, that mark these things out. That's why it's called markup. Something that's worth talking about this is um, links. Often on websites, we see examples where people use the same language around a lot of links on a single page, like for more information, click here or click here is hyperlinked. This is really unhelpful for people who are using screen readers who often um, use a function that reads out all the links to them on a page and then they, from those, that set of links, choose the one that they want to follow. If all the links that are read out to them are the same, if they all just say here, here, click here, 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 they have no idea where those links are going to take them. It's also actually really helpful for everyone just to be really clear about where someone will go when they click the link that you're encouraging them to. So here are some examples that um, we used to describe a video we made, which these tips are all taken from. We've hyperlinked Global Accessibility Awareness Day. That would communicate to someone that they were going to that website. We've hyperlinked Dig Inclusion and Digital Accessibility Center, two organizations that we worked with. Moving on, color combinations is something that you would want to think about as well. Many people struggle to perceive differences when colors are not sufficiently distinguished from the background. And obviously there are people with color blindness to consider as well. One tool which you can use for this, although there are many different color contrast checkers you can find by doing an internet search, is the web accessibility in mind checker. With this checker, you input colors using a hex code, which is the, the way that different colors are identified in HTML on websites. And you can then play with the lightness or darkness of those colors until you reach a contrast ratio that passes the web content accessibility guidelines. And this tool allows you to see that for whether it's normal text, large text, or a graphical interface component. And it will give you a pass at two different levels of compliance with the web content accessibility guidelines. Obviously, a AAA um, uh, compliance is better than an AA compliance, but AA compliance is usually what's used in legislation as far as I understand it. On a different topic, many forms and other transactional systems on websites have time limits. This can be difficult for people for a variety of reasons. So it's worth making sure that users have control over this, as we mentioned earlier. Give them the option to extend the session if they need to. It's worth thinking about adding an accessibility statement to your website that explains some of the things you've done and what people can do if they have issues using your website. This is our example, my website, citizensonline.org.uk forward slash policies. We emphasize that our policy is that our website shouldn't present barriers to people for anyone visiting the uh, this website, whether that's because of assistive technologies, a device with a less common screen size, or because they have a slower connection speed. We try as hard as we can to reduce the load times of individual pages so that people with slower connections are not disadvantaged when they access the website. You can do that, for instance, by making your pictures smaller or reducing the number of pictures on your website, for instance. Just to mention a couple of things that we've done. So for instance, we mentioned that we use WordPress that we chose an accessibility ready theme, that we aim to use simple language, that we've thought about the line length so that it's easier to read and same with font size and paragraph spacing, and that we've thought about our color combinations. When we did a rebrand recently, we instructed the uh, graphic designer we were working with to identify accessible color combinations for us, which we use in all our branding. While we're talking about accessibility statements, it's worth emphasizing that you should make it possible for people to contact you in a variety of different ways. Um, people have different preferences and may not wish to contact you through a form or email, but instead to have a phone conversation. This can be difficult. Um, for instance, our organization doesn't actually have a phone number at the moment. Um, we have reasons for that that I won't go into, but it's worth just trying to make sure there are different routes available to people to contact you. So we do at least have both form and email. One issue that this raises is spam. And lots of websites use systems which are referred to as CAPTCHA. 
to prevent uh, spam robots from sending messages they don't want to receive, whether through email or as comments. This can be a real problem for disabled users because the systems that are used to block out robots can often block out disabled people as well. If a capture requires people to see an image of distorted text, people who cannot see that image will not be able to fill it in. If an audio alternative capture relies on scrambling the audio a little in order to make it difficult for a robot to interpret, it will also become difficult for someone who has uh, low, um, who has a hearing impairment to be able to perceive that message. So there are a number of ways that you can deal with this. One is to use simple logic problems. Obviously some robots might be able to solve these, but it does block out some. So you could ask what color is grass, for instance, or what is two plus two? That can still block out some users. So you may choose to do what we do with our site, which is actually to have no um, blocking at all on forms and to deal with spam instead at your email inbox level. Um, we find that Outlook does quite a good job for a lot of spam. We still do get some spam coming through to the main email, but we would rather deal with that spam than block users from using our website. We also use a system called a Kismet to hide the email addresses that are mentioned on our website to try and lower some of the um, spam that we get through through that system. So before we move over to questions and answers, I just thought I'd mention a little bit more about the um, legislative requirement that I mentioned earlier. So on the accessibility.campaign.gov.uk website, you've got a clear guide to what public sector bodies need to do. And of course, as I said earlier, if you're not a public sector body, you can still follow this advice. So the first thing they say is to understand how the regulations will impact your organisation. Secondly, to decide how to check your website or app for accessibility problems. There are a number of automated accessibility checkers out there, but as I said earlier, it's always worth trying to engage disabled people themselves in your testing. Then you'd want to make a plan to fix any accessibility problems you find. And finally, publish an accessibility statement explaining what you've done and what people can do if they have issues. It's worth saying at the end of this presentation that most pages on the internet have at least one failure, according to the World um, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0, around 98% of pages. So you can understand why this can be a real problem for many disabled people. However, it's also worth emphasizing that most of these problems are very simple problems, which are easy to fix. A lot of accessibility is quite complicated, and you may need to talk to a professional web designer to solve some of the problems. However, low contrast text, which affects 86% of home pages, can be solved by anyone. Missing alt text on an image similarly affects two thirds of websites, but it's really simple now simply to add a description to any image you upload to your website. Empty links, missing form input labels, empty button, buttons, and missing document language are all ways of effectively referring to very similar problems in terms of the description that is available to someone who cannot necessarily see or perceive the information that you might think they could. So an empty link, for instance, is something that doesn't have a fully descriptive um, piece of text. Form input labels might be, it might be visually obvious what text is supposed to be put into the form, but there might not be any effective alt text that describes to someone using a screen reader what they're supposed to do with that part of the form and the same with buttons and, and documents. It's worth saying that what I've said about websites also applies to apps and crucially to PDF documents and other documents that your organization is circulating. Again, things like headings can be really important to make sure that documents are accessible to people. So I hope that's been useful to you and there's something new in there for everyone. Um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen now and we'll try and deal with some questions and answers. I don't think we've actually had any questions in the chat yet, James. So there's plenty of opportunity if people have got comments or uh, things that weren't clear, things that you'd like to ask at this stage. Um, 
probably the best thing to do at, rather than write in the chat is to put your raise your use the raise your hand function um, on the chat that's available uh, where's that <laughs> you need to go if you want to use the raise hand function I mean you can just say in the chat I'd like to ask yeah. a question but if you go yeah. to the participants button you should find that you get an option to raise your hand um, so we've got one good question um, from Gus Campbell about alt text. I'll try and come to the other ones. Gus, I'm going to just unmute you and if you could just ask your question. Okay, so um, we use alt text to work, but uh, well, while I'm clear about what I need to include for a image with text in it, I'm not sure what to include for a pictorial image. Uh, you know, do I describe colours? Do I describe what level of detail is helpful? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's always a good question. I, I do find that actually sometimes people overdo it on the, on the level of detail. And I think usually a simple short description is better. If there's a lot of information in an image, like you've got a graph or um, something like that that's trying to convey information, it's good to really spell that out, what that's um, conveying. But just if it's a, a picture of a, a house in the sunshine you know you can just say this is a house and you don't, don't need to say this is a picture of either um it can just be a, a short phrase describing it i don't think there's a need and, and so that it's a judgment call because sometimes in that image there will be something particular that the image is trying to convey um you know there's two people and, and one of them is in a certain position compared to the other you know to um talking down or something. So you might want to, if there's a meaning to the image, some kind of sense to it that is worth mentioning. But basically, if you're just decorating your site with an image um, to help the, the communication, yeah. Um, um, Matt, it doesn't Matt, need every single detail spelled out. Yeah, yeah Matt Holland has just um, passed on a link, which I agree is, is oh, right. quite helpful. Um, web yeah. accessibility in mind, they provide some examples for images and mm -hmm. guidelines around how much alt text you need to provide. And there are others as well. If you have a search for alt text guidelines, you'll come across lots of advice about when you need to do it. And as, as Fran says, it's a judgment call a lot of the time, because sometimes if you upload a an artistic, like a painting or something, sometimes you just want to give the title of the painting. Yeah. If, if the article is an analysis of that painting, then you would want to make sure that you describe how things are arranged in that painting, the style of the painting and so on. So it really is about the context in which the, the image is being used. Okay. I think we've got some other questions. Phil, Phil is raising his hand in real life. So let's unmute Phil. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that as well. Um, when you're doing images with alt text, you don't actually have to put in the alt text, this is an image of, or this is a picture of, because yeah. sometimes on some screen readers, it duplicates it. So somebody will actually hear, this is a picture of, this is a picture of, and they think it's like an echo. You just actually have to be very short and succinct with what you're doing. Um, great, thank you. I mean, I. I'm not the accessibility expert here. I have you know, thought about this stuff and worked in, on it for our site, but I'm very much a learner and I'm, I'm pretty sure we've got plenty of people on this call with, with more expertise and stuff. So please do um, share that. Um, Matt Holland is asking, if you don't mind me just speaking for you, Matt, what are your opinions about bolt-on accessibility toolbars? Um, and that's something I <laughs> would like to... Um, Actually, Matt, I will just unmute you in case you want to say anything more about that question. But um, I don't use one myself. Um, it would be great to have feedback from others. Yeah, Matt, go on, over to you. Uh, you're a little crackly, I think, Matt. Let's try, try it and see. No, I, th I think it's not working, Matt, unfortunately. Um, yeah, we, 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 you do see accessibility toolbars on lots of um, websites. Um, one, one that's probably worth signposting people to is Access In, which is developed by the Digital Accessibility Centre, who I mentioned earlier, which is an organisation we partner with. 
they have I think it's everyone who works for their organization but certainly everyone in their user testing team has a disability and the accessing system that they use enables someone to um, report an issue with a website or to contact someone who can potentially help them with it through having this um, added onto their their site um, Fran, do you want to talk briefly about the browse allowed thing that we do have? Because, I mean, that's not a toolbar, but it is sort of relevant to this question. Yeah, I think the toolbar is probably more aimed at people who are doing the web development. So but browse allowed is a plugin that we have on our site for all visitors. And it's, uh, it's surprisingly effective. It's very simple, um, but with some good options. Basically, it will read the, the main text of a page allowed to you. Um, it's quite nice really <laughs> you just sit there and, and let it let it talk to you um, obviously it's there for an accessibility reason um, and it's got loads of different options like the speed and it will also do translation from from other languages as well um, and we yeah browse allowed seem to be a really uh, not great organization that we're working with on accessibility stuff so if you go to assistance online website you'll be able to see the little orange button at the bottom which will um, launch the browse allowed yeah yeah. Um, so, someone else asked a, a question which uh, Sue Epo, I can't see, or possibly Sue Po, um, I can't see how to unmute Sue. Oh, I, yes, I can. Sue, would you like to ask your question? Yes, can you hear me? Um, I asked if um, a good accessibility affected search engine optimization. Yeah, the, the reason that one reason that I came to your question next, Sue, is because image text descriptions is a really good example of this. If you use alt text, then the search engine robots, which are um, doing the optimization of your site for searches, will be able to understand why you've put that image in your page in the same way that someone using a screen reader will. So that's one way in which using accessibility means that a screen reader can. Um, uh, uh, search engine can better understand what your website is about and ensure that it gets to the right people but it's not the only example um, things like having correct headings and structures of pages using simpler language where you can those things will all improve SEO as well um, I mean SEO is not our speciality at citizens online so I don't want to get too into that but those are the principles as far as I understand it I don't know if Fran you want to Add anything I was, on that? I was, no, I was exactly going to say the same thing. Really, just about the structure, the use of markup on the site. That really, you know, so I think Google, at least, probably all, all the search engines now kind of rank sites by kind of how well structured and accessible the text is. So it's very much connected to your SEO, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's two interesting things that have been mentioned in the chat here. Paul says, as I was sort of struggling to express concisely, search engine spiders are very similar to screen reader software. They're effectively doing exactly the same thing. Good point. And yeah. Phil um, mentions that if you use search engine optimization websites like Nibbler, it identifies in a similar way to accessibility checkers where tags are incorrect on your, your website. So that the two things do have a lot of um, similarities in terms of the processes. We had some other questions. Uh, Haley has asked if the slides will be available for download. We tend to send the slides around to people who are um, registered on the call, but anyone can access the recording of the of the video as well. And I, I should probably mention that the the images that I used are all from a much shorter video that just describes those tips, which we put out actually five years ago. They all still apply. Um, some things have changed a little, but not that much. Fran, do you want to identify another question? For yeah, me? I was just going to say, um, there's a really nice question from um, Morag, uh, Morag Clarkson, who asks about um, guidance for physical signage for places like, for example, a library um, to make that accessible. And that is not <laughs> something I'm qualified to speak on. But I, um, I don't know if you've got anything to say about that, James, but I would just flag up, I'll post in the comments, um, a friend of mine, a contact of ours called Alistair Somerville, who's um, pretty hot on this stuff. He's very interested in accessibility and the um, signage and the way people are able to get around and interact with places like museums and information there. So I'll, yeah. I'll put Alistair's details on that. Great. Um, yeah, I think more like similar yeah. things would apply. Um, yeah. Obviously the text size requirements would be different for um, physical rather than web uses. 
but there are fonts which are particularly recommended for accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, we use one which is called Source Sans Pro, which you would have to pay for to access, but um, it's, it's a, a font that is supposedly easier to read. In general, fonts that are sans serif, as in they don't have the extra curly bits on, should be easier to read for signage. And then in terms of color contrast, the color contrast that applies on websites would apply for physical signage as well. I imagine there are probably different checkers available for physical signage so that they rely on CMYK or RGB inputs. That's um, cyan, magenta, uh, whatever the other two are for, for print. <laughs> CMYK is basically the print system for um, colors. But even if you used one of the online color contrast checkers, you could then refer back hex codes. You can convert them online into um, RGB or red, green, blue, or CMYK, um, cyan, magenta um, systems. So you could identify a color contrast combination that you liked and that met the accessibility requirements and then turn it into one that you could um, more easily replicate for printed materials or ask a, a, a printer that you're working with to comply to. Okay, um, there's a question from Elliot. Elliot George, I'm just going to try and um, unmute you, Elliot, so you can maybe ask that question yourself about the uh, contrast between experience, user experience and accessibility. Yeah, I guess I'm um, trying to overcomplicate things too much. But, um, you know, I suppose if, if a service, I'm thinking more perhaps in the private sector, isn't kind of enjoyable, delightful, a great experience, a memorable experience, how much you kind of factor that into the general accessibility thinking. You know, everything else could be in place. You could have ticked all these boxes, but mm. it might, users might still switch off. Do you want to go yeah. down or shall I? I can <laughs> offer some thoughts. <laughs> I mean, I was yeah. just going to say it's, 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 we like to say, and I mean, in the text advertising this event, I said that often making things accessible for disabled people can improve them for everyone. But it's worth saying that this is a bit of a tension, really. It's not always the case. And as you say, you can make something that is accessible, but not very enjoyable to use for most people. Um, however, it's also the case that people who really emphasize making something delightful or exciting for um, able users to access can often end up making it inaccessible by doing so. So I think our way of thinking about it would be that the first priority is to ensure that no one's being excluded to hope that that's making it a better experience for everyone and then to think about how you can continue the user experience improvements beyond that. Um, I saw, for instance, an interesting thread on this on Twitter recently that a lot of the focus in those sort of um, web design circles has been on uh, making things delightful, that specific word, but that COVID, for instance, has really reminded us that a lot of people lack access at all. What they're interested in is making sure that a service works for them in the simplest possible way. They want to register for online shopping. They don't much care how enjoyable it is. They just want to be able to achieve that function. Um, so it's, it's, it's a tension, basically. It's, it's a tricky thing to, to manage. Obviously, we all want to make services as enjoyable to use as possible. Yeah, that's, that's very true. I think the, the gov.uk sites have made quite a good um, impact on this in recent years. You know, they don't look super flashy, but they are really optimized for accessibility, simplicity, people just, you know, people aren't going there for fun, they're going there to find out a piece of information or get something, get a service done. And, um, but you know, they work pretty well and I think they've been leading the way on that and also on the simplicity of language that they use and um, clarity of English. So um, yeah, and, I mean, sometimes a boring site is good, but as, as James said, you know, the, the, the baseline needs to be the accessibility really. And there are loads of great, designers out there making wonderful, um, attractive and fun websites that are still fully accessible. So I just think, yeah. Um, the, the Swede, you've got your hand up. I'm gonna to come to you next, go on. Um, it was a couple of things. Um, firstly, if anybody's got any experience of Vimeo and whether that's um, as good for people with disabilities, we're part of a network and we get all sorts of videos from the network in on many different platforms. Um, so I was wondering if anybody, I'm new to Vimeo, so I don't know if it's 
got the same sort of facilities as YouTube. And just on the last point you were making, um, this week, this week was it? Yes, this week. Um, I'm part of um, a service user network for people with mental health problems. And um, we had a website that was very flashy and everything, but we couldn't use at all. You couldn't find any information on it. Um, so this week we've been to the board and told them about it. And it was that they just didn't realize because if you're not, if you don't have a disability, it doesn't occur to you that for instance, you might not be able to access something or that um, uh, there was a particular problem with the text being white and the background being orange, which I don't know if anybody can read that, but it was because their logo's in orange, so they wanted the website to be orange. And in fact, even the company orange don't use as much orange as them. So get rid of the orange. <laughs> but yeah, that was the point I wanted to make. That's a really good point, thank you, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's two things there that come to mind. First is obviously user testing, actually getting people with, who are disabled to test the site and there are tools as James mentioned earlier that will try and replicate some aspects of what it's like for example to have color blindness or you know things that you can do as James said like to just use your keyboard to try and but it's not the same as actually getting people to say what's this like as an experience for me um, that's it's not the easiest thing to do you know and it can cost money as well um, to get your site properly tested but we would advocate that and also um, just having a, a policy that is making it really clear that users can contact you and say, look, I didn't enjoy my experience on your site, it didn't work for me. And the policy that says we will listen to that and remedy that. I, I don't know what, about your experience the other day, but um, it might have compensated ever so slightly if you've been able to feel like you could let them know about that and that they would respond. They were very surprised. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, 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 you know, it's easy to get it wrong first time, but you have to try yeah. and keep iterating and improving. So, yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. I don't know about Vimeo. Does anyone else have any? Yeah, um, I was just going to say on Vimeo, my understanding is that Vimeo does have perfectly adequate subtitling features. You'll need to upload a subtitle file, though. So it's worth sort of comparing it, I guess. I mean... I think Facebook now does have some automatic captioning, but until recently it didn't. So I was, the, the system that I described, uploading to YouTube, getting their automatic captions, editing them, and then uploading them onto uh, Facebook. I would also have done if I'd wanted to get a video on Vimeo, mm -hmm. um, because transcribing is very time consuming. Um, if you've got a video like this one will be, which is 45 minutes long, it's going to take you probably a day to transcribe it. Um, if you've got a two minute video, then fine, you know, it's, it doesn't take too long. Um, uh, the things that Vimeo doesn't have that YouTube does have at the moment. So A, YouTube has the, the system I, I showed on screen where you can live edit captions. It also has a function, although at the moment that function is under threat, where people can contribute captions to a video. You can on YouTube videos, you can enable community contributions to captions and that means that anyone can edit the captions on your video within reason i think there is some protections around that um, although that's one of the reasons that youtube are considering removing the functionality and what you could do is reach out to volunteers that are associated with your organization or other people in your network who might perhaps be interested in helping you to do that captioning through that system or, or potentially just through you sending them the subtitle file and asking if they could help you with it um, I would really emphasize that you don't want to be asking disabled people themselves to be doing that work, but hopefully some of your organizations do have people who might be able to help you with, with doing the captioning for that. I think we've got most, got to most of the questions. So. Okay, there's a few things in the Wait. chat that are just worth um, reading out on the call. So first off, um, I said I couldn't remember the W3C, which was the World Wide Web Consortium. I think that's right. Thanks to Francis <laughs> for saying that. Yeah, I think that's right too. Um, as Lee points out that even if you're not a public sector organisation, the 2010 Equality Act will still apply to you. And that's the basis for the UK legislation around web accessibility. So you should still be trying to ensure that people aren't being excluded from your services by following accessibility guidelines. 
Um, we didn't cover navigation. Um, we didn't get many options here, but breadcrumbs is um, what we refer to this as. I'll perhaps try and um, share an example of it at some point during the call. Uh, Fran points out that I was a bit wrong when I when I mentioned Akismet. Akismet is a is a tool that we use for um, the, the comments on our site to prevent spam. We use a different system to to cloak the email addresses that we we list on our site so that we don't get bots harvesting those those email addresses. And then someone asked as a sort of follow up to what I was saying about the um, social media alt text. I mean. I don't actually know if there is good practice around this. I tend to think it is better, if you can, to use the text that is in an image, just in the tweet text. But this isn't obviously always possible. In the example I showed, my preference actually would be to do that. I would just say, next week, we're running a session called whatever it's called at this time, at this place, here's the link. And then the image, I might just say, citizens online logo or i might not even give it alt text because it's not really necessary uh, i do tend to like to give alt text even where it doesn't feel necessary just to let people know that it hasn't been necessary so i would just put citizens online logo or something like that just to let people know that's all that the image is effectively doing um what was the other thing i was going to say yeah i was just going to say that applies in that example where the image is just an advert for an event but where the image is a longer extract of text and you obviously couldn't fit it all into the tweet that's when you need to be using the the alt text really so like i said it's if you've got a if you've taken a picture of a book or a report or you've taken a screenshot from an article that's of some length then you'd want to be copy pasting that text from an article into the alt text or, or something like that. And you'll find on Twitter that often you would be sharing more text than you can actually describe in alt text, but you can probably identify which are the key sentences that you really want people to focus on or be able to um, understand from your um, screenshot. And always the other thing is if you're, if you're screenshotting from an article, just include the link to that article and then someone can, can follow that link and, and read the full text. So there's different different ways of dealing with that problem depending on the on the context essentially. Um, there is one question I think we haven't got to, which is Alastair um, about broken um, empty buttons and empty links. I've just unmuted you, Alastair, in case you want to say a bit more about that. Um, well, no, I'd say probably everybody un understands that, but um, to me, a button is normally a link. Uh, and, and notice that on the empty links, it was like 60 something percent yeah. on the empty button. But uh, maybe empty buttons can have a wider use than a, uh, just a link. I don't know. It's, I, think, um, I think the distinction is around, so for an empty link would mean things like click here or here, something yeah. that is empty in terms of the fact that it lacks a description. And then a button is in terms of the fact that that button might have text above it that says click the button below to access our sale items but then the button below is just a button it's just like a red circle right. or a button saying click here for instance so it's about ensuring that those two separate things have concise and descriptive descriptions in the case of a link that the text that's highlighted is concise and descriptive yeah. and in the case of the button that it has an uh, that it has alt text that describes where that button takes you and there's specific markup in HTML for buttons as well, which makes them properly accessible and displayed. So, yeah. Yeah, because of course you can edit the link wording anyway, can't you? Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah so another thing that might be worth saying is around, around use of links is that, for instance, in group chats like this, we can't do much with our links. We have to share the raw URL, it's called. Um, so we get sometimes these very long ones um, and you want to be avoiding those in any documents or websites that you're using really. You want to use hyperlink functionality to hyperlink a set of text to the complicated URL. Sometimes you might want to share a URL, but you should try and limit that to really simple URLs like just the website, for instance, you know, citizensonline.org.uk or perhaps one extra word afterwards citizensonline.org.uk forward slash events, for instance. 
that sort of stuff is concise. It's descriptive. It can be read. People understand how web links work to that extent. Once you start getting into the, you know, in this um, GDS example that we've got in the chat, for instance, you've got uh, three different date categories. You've got the year, the month, and the day. You've then got the title, but with dashes through it. It's very difficult for someone realistically to read that. One thing you can do is try and edit those URLs so that the, if it's an important URL that you want to share a lot, you can make it one which is directly after the, the main um, address of your website. But also you can think about how much of the title needs to be represented in the URL. So the default for when you create a web page will often be to use the full title with um, hyphens between each word. But you can usually edit that down to just a couple of words um, to convey the content of what that page is, is about. <laughs> yeah, or, or as Matt says, you could use a link shortener. I think it's probably a bit of a debate about link shorteners at the moment because a lot of the sort of scam advice from government is not to follow links that look dodgy. And unfortunately, a lot of like the bit.ly or other link shorteners like tiny URL, they can potentially give the impression to someone that they don't actually know where they're going with that link. You could click a bit.ly link thinking it goes to a government website, but actually takes you to a, a phishing site that's harvesting your data. Yeah. So I personally have kind of steered away from using them in, in recent years and try instead to use citizensonline.org.uk forward slash some shortened link that we've potentially created that might redirect to a longer URL, but, um, but not using the, the link shortening services so much. That said, a lot of public sector organizations are still using those link shorteners. So I might just be, be being overly cautious um, in that myself. So we've, um, I've realized we've gone substantially over time today. We've actually got to 12 o'clock, so we better wrap things up. Um, before we all go, we have actually got some more slides to share with you. So I'll try and be really quick through these. So first off, as I mentioned, today is Global Accessibility Awareness Day and um, DWP, the Department of Work and Pensions, have actually got further sessions on accessibility if you're interested. Um, you'll have to go to this, um, their blog right now to be able to get this because by the time I send the slides around, these will have mostly happened, I'm afraid. But they've got a series of sessions that you might be interested on, on developing your accessibility further, particularly if you are working in public sector. And there's what sounds like a really interesting session from Worcester City Council on how to make a workforce interested in making accessibility accessible, uh, making, making accessibility something that they're interested in. I mentioned two organisations that we worked with particularly when creating the video that I've basically outlined today. That's the Digital Accessibility Centre and I mentioned their Access In tool but they provide a wide range of other services and resources as well. So do check out their website. We also worked with Dig Inclusion. They particularly offer services around making PDF documents accessible and training for your teams in terms of how to make your content accessible. And then it's worth mentioning just some more generic things that we've been signposting people to. Digital to Unite have something called the Digital Champions Network, which is currently free to join as an individual or an organization. It includes um, courses on accessibility for people who are helping others. So if you're helping a disabled person to access the internet and you want to be able to advise them about assistive technologies or so on, then the Digital Champions Network has information to help you with that as well as their guides and resources for general digital skills help and specific remote support help at the moment. We've also recently published some blogs you might be interested in. One is about ensuring that organizations that are contacting people who are shielding or self-isolating are being asked about their digital skills so that they can be signposted to organizations like ours or others to support those people. Often those people will be disabled people, so that's why I thought this was worth mentioning today. Accompanying the video that I mentioned, we have a web page called Accessibility Tips, which covers the 15 tips I outlined and covers further information about each of them, signposting to tools and resources that you can use to gain greater understanding of them. And it also includes the, the transcript of our video. Hopefully it's a good example of 
um, what you could do to accompany key videos that you put out. Um, that was produced five years ago. So Francis also wrote a more up-to-date blog post on accessibility resources covering 11 tools that you can use. Uh, we've also recently produced a age and digital exclusion heat map of the UK based on GP surgeries data. And again, this might be of particular interest to people who are working with, uh, sorry, organisations that are working with disabled people who are potentially more likely to be um, regularly accessing their GPs and potentially more likely to be cut off from that support by um, the need to do so digitally. And as we've mentioned on every one of our calls, we also have a generic coronavirus support resources page, which has got lots of information about supporting others with digital skills or remote working, video conferencing. And this week we've added some resources on privacy and security. Next week, we're gonna be talking about something which has launched today, which is the 2020 Consumer Digital Index, uh, a report released by Lloyds every year it's really helpful, tells you all about digital capability in the UK. And we'll talk about how we've been using previous um, editions of the Consumer Digital Index to support our work, as well as some of the key information from this year's report next week at 11 o'clock. You can register for that event now via citizensonline.org.uk forward slash events, where you can also see recordings of all our previous sessions. So thanks to everyone for coming and apologies that we've gone a little bit over time. Um, you can contact myself or Francis by email or on Twitter, and my phone number is also there. If you'd like to contact me, it's 07734 058 789.